In the first letter of Paul to the Corinthian, Paul deals with a church that's in turmoil for, uh, for various reasons. The letter reveals the character of these people and a major reason that they have so many problems. And the major reason that they have so many problems in that congregation, in a word, is because of pride, personal pride. This is why in 1 Corinthians 13, that beautiful passage on love, one of the first things that Paul mentions about love's character is that love is never boastful. Love is never boastful or proud. And so of all the things that kill relationships, whether they are in the church, or a marriage relationship, or a friendship, pride is the deadliest one of all. Now, I want to share with you some of the things that pride produces, not only that we see here in Corinthians, but just you know, by looking around us in our relationships with various people. For example, pride provokes arguments. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 10, the writer says, pride only breeds quarrels. When you try to understand why people are arguing, did you ever notice that it's the result many times of someone's wounded pride? You know, something was said, something was done, something was perceived as being an offense of some kind to a person's ego, to a person's pride, and they become puffed up, and then what happens? Quarrels ensue. Nations go to war because of an insult to their national pride. Another thing that pride produces uh, is misunderstanding. Again, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, uh, Jesus says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You know, when our pride is hurt, when our ego is in danger, our ears don't seem to function anymore. We're not hearing, we're not listening anymore when our pride is wounded. When we are all puffed up with injured pride, you know, we tend to jump to conclusions, we invent all kinds of supposed intentions and motivations on other people's part. We become suspicious of everything that someone else will do. Why? Because our, our pride is wounded. When our pride is injured, we become unreasonable and vulnerable to Satan's manipulation. You know, when I was a, a kid growing up, uh, we had the cardinal sins in the Catholic Church, that were the, the cardinal sin, and the very first sin of the cardinal sins was the sin of pride. And rightly so, because it's so, so destructive. Another thing that pride does is it prevents intimacy. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, it says, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with each other. The problem is that pride produces the exact opposite of what we really want and what we really need and what is really satisfying in our relationship with other people, and that's intimacy. Boasting, sensitive egos, hurt pride, these are not part of the light of godly living. It produces factions and strife and alienation. It's difficult to walk in the light of Christian fellowship if we are dominated by our own pride. You know, people are impressed by what? They're impressed by humility. They're impressed by meekness. They are drawn to this because it's of Christ. When they come in contact with us, the thing that impresses them the most is our Christ-likeness. And Christ-likeness is humility, not, not pride. Pride destroys intimacy and it promotes loneliness and has a way of isolating us from other people. You ever notice that happens? Your pride is injured, somebody said something you didn't like and it's just, you know, boy, it's a blow to your ego. And what happens? You know, many times we, we shrink back, don't we? We're hurt, we go, you know, we go away into our own little corner, we create our own little bubble to protect ourselves. Why? Because our pride is wounded, that's why, that's what pride does. It isolates us. 
It's a, it's, a, it's a tool that Satan uses many times not only to separate us one from another, not just friends or brothers or sisters in Christ, but husband and wives and work partners and so on and so forth. It's, it's an insidious type of thing that's, that's very destructive. And also, pride postpones reconciliation. In Proverbs 28.13, the writer says, he who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So temper usually gets us into trouble, but it's pride that keeps us there. You know, we have a quick temper, we have a quick tongue, and we, we talk back, or we say what we shouldn't say, or we lash out, you know, and that does the damage. But many times it's our pride that maintains that damage over a long period of time. Why? Too proud, we're too proud to apologize, too proud to acknowledge that maybe we've said or done something hasty or, or foolish. Have you ever noticed in your own lives or in the lives of family members who don't talk to each other, who avoid going to weddings or events where the other one will be at? Does that happen in your family? Well, you know, if Margaret is going, uh, you know we're not going. You ever have that happen in your family? Oh, who's going? Yeah, come on over to our house. We're going to have Thanksgiving over to our house this year. Oh yeah? Uh, wait a minute, is Uncle Joe going to be there? Oh, forget it. You know, wherever he goes, we don't go. Yeah. So many times that type of thing happens. Happened in our family. And many times when you talk to the people who, have, who are holding on to the grudge, they don't even remember. They say, Uncle Joe, what's the problem? I don't know, something back there that happened. I don't know, but I just know I'm still mad. You know, all they remember is they've got a grudge. They don't know why. Why do they have the grudge? Why does it last for so long? Pride. Pride is what keeps us apart in many cases. The refusal to come down from whatever righteous tower or protective bubble that we've entered in order to protect, not ourselves, in order to protect our pride. Well, why don't you just apologize? No, no, he's going to go first. I'll apologize, but he has to go first. Well, who's speaking there? I always tell people, in your head that's giving you this kind of advice, is that Jesus giving you that kind of advice? No, 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 he's going to have to apologize first. I'm not kowtowing to that guy. Oh yeah, you really sound like the Lord. Boy, I'm going to follow you. Maybe you ought to be the guy who disciples other people in the church with that attitude. And so the, the title of my lesson tonight is, Let Go Your Ego. Let go your ego, which is something that is very, very difficult to do. Understanding the problems, knowing what should be done, doesn't make it any easier. One thing is for sure, we all have ego, and it's the most fragile as well as precious thing we possess, so letting it go is very, very difficult. Of course, by letting go, I don't mean totally denying our sense of self. I mean letting go the exaggerated sense of self that leads to egotism and destructive pride. Now the Bible provides guidance in helping us let go of egotism and sinful pride that causes so many problems in our lives, especially in our relationships. So how do we let go our ego? Well, first of all, you have to accept your own imperfections. Step one, accept your imperfections. You know, we all understand the idea that nobody's perfect. How many times have we said that when we make a mistake? Well, nobody's perfect. But most of the time we operate under the, uh, uh, the impression that we ought to be perfect. In Romans 3.23, um, uh, Paul says, uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Notice the most important word in that, in that, in that verse. All. All have sinned. There are no exceptions. All have sinned. In Proverbs it says, Who can say, I have kept my heart pure? I am clean and without sin. Solomon said, Who can say such a thing? It was kind of a rhetorical question. Nobody. In Romans chapter 12, verse three, Paul says, don't think you are better than you really are. Now these are not suggestions. These are not criticisms leveled at us. 
They are a divine confirmation regarding what God knows to be true about us. We are not perfect, correct? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, correct? Check. Can anyone say I am without sin? My heart is pure? No. Check. God knows that we are imperfect and He wants us to know that He knows. The problem is getting us to accept our imperfection, not Him. He's already accepted our imperfections. We're the ones that have problems with that. And so the first step in deflating egotism is to recognize that, well, there's absolutely no good reason for it. <laughs> It shouldn't exist, there's no reason for it. Recognizing that there are no grounds for our pride is the beginning of humility. Humility is not the absence of ego, humility is the ability of recognizing the true value of our ego. That's humility. Humility is not going around all the time saying, oh, I'm no good. I'm no good, I'm so unworthy, oh no, don't ask me, I'm just an unworthy person. That's not humility. That, that person walking around like that, that person needs counseling for a whole other issue. Humility is having the right measure of ourselves. Not too much, not too little, but the right accurate measure of our strengths and our weaknesses. I mean, a humble person isn't without personality. A humble person simply is one who has an accurate assessment of his true strengths and his weaknesses. And the humble person is a realist when it comes to himself or herself. They're realists. So number one, how do we let go our ego? First and foremost, accept your imperfections. Accept them and understand that God also knows and accepts them. Number two, recognize God's grace. Recognize God's grace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 Paul says, what do you have that you did not receive? Come on, make a list. What do you have that God hasn't given you? Is there anything? Most pride is based in self. My ego, my feelings, my needs, my glory, my reputation how other people ought to treat me. That's, that's all egotism. If we're the center of our own universe, we are then the source of all that is good and bad in our lives. And so the sin of pride is taking credit for God's work, assuming that our power is making things happen, taking responsibility for meeting out justice when offended. In reality, however, all that we have all that we need is supplied by God's power and He does so because of His grace. He doesn't do it because we deserve it. He does it because He's good. He's kind. He's gracious. And when we recognize that our entire life is supported by God's grace, a couple of things start to happen. First of all, our world finds its correct order. God is God and we are the created and we are freed from the trap of the sin of idolatry. It's, it sounds like a, a simple thing, doesn't it? Recognizing that God is God and we are we, but that's like some kind of spiritual breakthrough when you really get to that point. It lifts the burden of responsibility for everything off of your shoulders. He's responsible. You're the created thing. We're the ones that offer Him the worship. We wait on Him. He doesn't wait on us. Another thing that happens is we begin to tap into His power to provide for our needs, which relieves us of this burden as well. God hears the prayers of the humble. What does that mean? It means God hears the prayers of those individuals who are praying with the knowledge that their need can only be fulfilled by God. And all that they have comes from Him. And then thirdly, we begin to serve God rather than self, which produces joy and peace in our hearts rather than anger and fear and crabbiness. I don't know if that's a word, but anyways. So the, 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 the more noise on the outside, 
the emptier on the inside. You know, a proud heart is empty of grace. So recognizing God's grace enables us to remove self at the center of our lives and place Christ in that position because He belongs there and, and we don't. We don't belong at the center of our own universe. Christ belongs there. All right, a third way of dealing uh, with our pride is the following. Experience God's unconditional love. In Romans chapter five, verse eight, Paul says, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, when the focus of our emotional energy is the love of self, when all of our energy goes into protecting and nurturing our own egos, we usually end up dissatisfied. You know, we can never love ourselves enough. Have we learned that? Have we lived long enough to understand? No matter how much you try to love yourself, it's never enough. Our love, even of self, is always limited by sin and based on performance. You know, we love ourselves if we succeed, we hate ourselves if we fail. What a vicious cycle that is. And I know a lot of people on that treadmill. They're happy, everything is great, they love themselves, all's right with the world, so long as everything's going okay. But then when things start going this way, then they don't like themselves very much. Then their self-talk is, yeah, what's the matter with you? Stupid, 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 you know? Well, of course, if you're in charge of you, yeah, you take the credit when it goes well, but when it doesn't go well, then you take the blame as well. I mean, look, 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 at, look at the famous people who never have enough attention and applause and who are continually miserable because the love and the attention that they seek comes from sinful human beings and it's always conditioned on their performance. You ever wonder why people who are rich and famous many times, you find them so many times, uh, abuse drugs? Why? Why would they abuse drugs? Why would they commit suicide? Why would they do that? They've been given these incredible gifts, these talents, whatever that is, uh, beyond what is normal. They're being paid tremendous sums of money. They're famous. They have advantages. You know, they're always at the front of the line. I heard a guy once, an actor, and said, well, how, how, how's your life changed since you've become famous? He said, there's always a table for me at the restaurant. I always pass to the front of the line. That's a nice perk of being famous. But these same famous people kill themselves. Why? Because they're looking for satisfaction from other human beings. And it's just, it's just not there. And so the way out of this cycle is to experience the unconditional and perfect love of Christ. This is a love freely offered because of God's goodness and not our own. This is a love dependent on God's ability to love, not our performance. So important. I experience God's love not because I'm performing perfectly, I'm experiencing God's love because He loves perfectly. When we understand that, it makes such a difference in our lives. This is a love that lasts as long as God gives it, which is forever, not as long as we deserve it. Sometimes we deserve to be loved, but that time some, you know, usually runs out. But God's promised us that He will always love us. He will never forsake us. What a promise. What an experience. And of course, God's love is a love that is patient and kind and gentle and pure and faithful and controlled and generous, not subject to moods or conditions or circumstances. Who do you think that Paul is talking about when he says love is patient, love is kind, and so on and so forth? Do you think he's talking about a human being? He's not talking about a human being. He's talking about God's love. The love of Christ is patient, is kind, is not boastful, is generous, is gentle, and so on and so forth. We emulate that, obviously. We, got, we have to have something to shoot for. But that perfect love he's talking about, it's the love with which God loves us. 
That's why it's so beautiful. That's why it's so high and exalted. So our pride and our self-righteousness, our ego protection mechanisms, they melt in the face of this kind of love. When we offer this kind of unconditional love or the best that we can, you know, the best that we can emulate it, when we offer this kind of love to ourselves and others, we will be free from the demands of pride in ourselves and avoid provoking the sins that accompany pride in others. One of the <laughs> passages that I often repeat, uh, probably more than any other, because it fits so well in every situation, you know, is the one in Proverbs 16, 18. Before a fall comes, comes pride. I, I tell that to my fellow golfers when we go out and play on my day off and they're, they're bragging about how, how fast and how, or rather how far they're going to hit that ball and maybe they're going to get a birdie on this hole. Boy, I tell them, you know, before a fall comes pride. Before a double bogey comes pride. You know. And then another passage, 1 Peter 5, 5 says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Who gets grace? The humble, they get grace. I mean, you know, people say, yeah, but it's so hard to get rid of your pride, you know, so, diff you know, so hard to you know, bring yourself down, deflate that, psh, deflate that ego. It's difficult, yes, but look at the payoff. Look at the payoff. God says His grace is for the humble. The pride, He brings them down. The humble, He, he raises them he raises them up. And there is ample warning in both the Old and New Testament about the dangers of egotism and pride. And so we can, we can deal effectively with these things in all of our lives if we remember the, the few things that I, that I mentioned tonight, certainly if we practice them. So let's remember to accept the fact that we are not perfect and that God is willing to deal with us in this way. He's willing to deal with us despite our imperfections. Let's face it, if He who is perfect is willing to accept us imperfect, we should be willing to accept ourselves and others with all those imperfections as well. Think about it. God who is perfect accepts me who is imperfect. Well then surely I can accept myself and I can accept others who are imperfect, surely I can do that. Surely I, I don't have to be more demanding on myself than God is, or demanding of others than God is. Secondly, let's remember to accept God's grace for our imperfections rather than masking them with pride and ego. See, that's, the, that's Satan's uh, snare. He tries to seduce us into trying to mask our imperfections with pride and ego rather than laying this burden at the cross of Christ and accepting grace for those things. Once we acknowledge our sins, it is such a great relief to depend on God's grace for our existence and salvation than the impossible demands of ego. And then finally, let's make sure that we, accept, we know about God's love. I'm convinced everybody here knows about God's love. We can quote John 3, you know, 16, for God so loved the world. We know about God's love, but you know what? It, there's another step to take. It's not enough just to know God's love. We need to accept it. We need to appropriate it for ourselves. And many times people don't do that. Why? Because their pride is in the way. Egotism is looking for love in the wrong way and in the wrong place. God's unconditional love gives us the freedom to love others and ourselves in a way that promotes peace of mind and self-acceptance. This unconditional love was demonstrated through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. You know, a visual parable, that's what the cross is. I mean, it's many, many things, but it's a visual parable parable. You know, my, uh, our son William, he always tells me, Dad, don't read me. Don't read me the instructions. Show me. Show it to me. If I see it, I can do it. And it's true. That's the way he learns. He's one of those guys, if you just do it in front of him, he gets it and he can do it. Well, you know what? I think that's what God did with Christ. 
He, didn't he could have sent us you know, written instructions. I love you, therefore I forgive you. Hey, I really, really, really love you a lot. How many times? I love you squared, infinity, I love you. And he could have written it down. And he could have given it each one. Dear Michael, you know, handwriting. I love you, God, on paper. But that's, he didn't do that. He gave us an object lesson. He gave us a show and tell. He gave us the cross of Christ so that we could actually see with our eyes and hear with our ears and touch with our hands how much, how much He loves you. And so this unconditional love was demonstrated through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Even though we were imperfect, even though we were full of self, even though we hated Him, God offered Jesus' blood to cover our imperfections and reveal His selfless love for us and show us how to love ourselves and how to love others. You want to see how much I love you? The Father says, take a look at the cross. That's how much I love you. You can deny a lot of things and we can argue over a lot of things. You know, in the church there's always some debate on some doctrine or other, but there's one thing that all of us cannot deny, and that is how much God loves us. I've never heard a debate. I've never heard a debate between two Christians debating about how much God loves us. The cross of Christ you know, supersedes any debate. God offered Jesus' blood to cover our imperfections and reveal His selfless love for us and show us how to love other people. We can begin experiencing this unconditional love by receiving forgiveness for our pride and other sins, and we know the answer here, right? By believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of our sins, and being baptized in His name. And it's interesting, this idea of baptism. Is there any action more humbling? Is there any action more humbling, in a sense, symbolically, than baptism? I mean, you take off all your, you know, wearing a nice tie and a shirt and you know, whatever, all your, your covering. And when you're baptized, I mean, you kind of strip down to your bathing suit, pretty much. No covering, right? There goes the facade. There goes the cowboy look. There goes the preppy look. There goes the sports look. There goes the, you know, whatever, whatever senior look, shirt and tie, <laughs> whatever that is. Yeah. And everybody is down to their bathing suit for modesty's sake. And what happens? Somebody says, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And by making the confession of faith that you believe that, you have just said, He is God and I am under Him. I am the created thing. And then, and then to have somebody take us in their arms, so to speak, and, and lower us, we don't do it, they do it to us, lower us into the water. We're helpless and then bring us back up all sopping wet. Is there any action more humbling than that? I, I didn't say humiliating. There are things that could be humiliating. Well, of course, the, the purpose of baptism is not to humiliate us in any way. If anyone was ever humiliated, it was Jesus. He's the one crucified naked on the cross. How's that for humiliation? As a man, it's the maximum humility. Humiliation. Imagine, to be naked and to be nailed to a tree in public and have people spit on you. That's humiliation. What we experience in baptism isn't humiliation. It's an expression of humility. And it's proper that it, it's the first step in our Christian life. The very first thing that God asks of us is that we humble ourselves. It's as if he says, Let, let's get this relationship off to a good start, shall we? Let's get this thing going on the right foot. I want you to humble yourself and be buried 
in water as a way to express your faith in the fact, in the reality, that Jesus is God and you are the created thing. He is above and you are below. Of course, we can return to God's unconditional love by being restored through prayer. Even that is humbling, isn't it? Why? Because we have to say, you know, I was faithful and then I was unfaithful. Or I was strong and now I'm weak. Or I was healthy and now I'm sick. Or I was following Christ and I, I, I was doing well, but now I stumbled, I've stumbled into sinfulness. Saying and expressing all those things before God. Again, not humiliating, humbling finding our true position in life before God and before others. And so whatever you need, whatever it is, it always begins with humility. Those prayers that you're sending up to the heavens for whatever it is that you want require humility before they are answered. That's why God says He raises the humble. He answers their prayers. He sets them in a good place. And the proud He brings down. And sometimes the bringing down is the not answering our prayers. So let's be careful when we pray. Let's be thinking when we respond to the invitation. And if this is the night where you have to humble yourself in some way, to be baptized, to be restored, to acknowledge weakness, a need, then uh, Brother Harold's going to lead us in a, a song. And while we're singing, let's think about that and see if we need to make some sort of response to the word of God. Shall we stand, shall we sing? <laughs>